So how do you generate a multiple alignment given that information? So I want to just talk about how it, how it used to be done almost before I was born. Um, this is actually a, um, a multiple sequence alignment that they've got at the, at the University of Edinburgh. And I gave a talk on multiple sequence alignment at Edinburgh and they, they pulled this thing out and said, oh, you must see this, Jeff. So I had to have a picture of me holding it. Um, and this is azurin, so it's a particular protein. And what they did was, I think back in the 1960s, they were sequencing azurins from different species. And they've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine of them here. And, they, and as they sequenced them, they used Edmund degradation to do the sequencing. So it was chemical sequencing of the protein, not the nucleic acid. You didn't have DNA sequencing when they did this. Um, <clears throat> so they were sequencing the proteins. And every time they got another amino acid confirmed from the sequencing, they went, yay! <laughs> and they went to this board on the wall and they hung a little ring. They wrote on the amino acid, there was a valine there, and they hung it on the ring, on the hook. And then they went on and did the next one. And at least I assume that's what happened. I wasn't there, I'm guessing. It sounds like a nice... I can just imagine those eureka moments over the Edmund degradation. You know. um, and then they built this up, and these are, these are gaps, these are insert deletions, this is an insertion in this one relative to the others and so on. So they built a multiple alignment rather laboriously and experimentally, probably over many, many months, to generate this. So that's probably the 1960s. There's a close-up, in case you couldn't see it, these little rings with the three anemes, nice leucine. Isn't that lovely? I, I really wanted this, but they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> so 1984, that's the year I started my PhD. And, uh, and um, there were programs around that we had more sequences. At that time, there were about 2,500 protein sequences known. And the way in which people aligned sequences, um, there, were some, there was some software around to do it. It wasn't very good or easy to use or anything. Um, but the most common thing people did was they actually wrote the amino acid sequence on a piece of squared paper. And then you slid them along relative to each other and tried to line them up by eye. And if you had to, um, had to if you had to put an insertion or deletion in, uh, you use scissors. Okay. Um, so you could move. And yeah, we really did. People really did do that. I have to say, I never did that because I'm not. I'm lazy, and I don't couldn't see the point. I wrote programs to do it, but. This is an example that my boss did at the time. Uh, he didn't actually do the cutting out and sliding around. What he did was he, he, he wrote the amino acids along here. Um, and he realized when he'd written out the alignment that actually made a mistake. So he drew these lines to say, well, actually, I think the alignment should really go like this. This, this should line with this one. Um, um, he knew about the secondary structure of one of the proteins. So he drew that on as these arrows. So this is the secondary structure of one of the proteins. Um, he realized he made a mistake, so he redrew the alignment underneath to take account of what he thought was the answer. Um, aren't you glad you live in the 2016 and not you know, 1984? Um, and, you know, and there's various other mysterious, there's these stars here, what do they mean? I mean, if you're, if you're now used to looking at amino acid sequences and you've completely remembered the Venn diagram and amino acid properties, you can tell me what these might mean, no? somebody who's an expert. Maybe conservation, like singularly uh, yeah. similar properties. Similar properties, yeah, yeah, similar properties. Hydro generally hydrophobic, so actually. Not always hydrophobic, but generally hydrophobic. So yeah, there you go. And this is actually the code that he used for a star, which is also on the figure. So there was a key to help you. Um, and this is the whole line. It didn't all fit on one page, so you had to you know, carry on another page. These are actually ribosomal proteins, um, different members of the ribosome. In fact, this alignment is completely wrong, but we don't go there. I showed this. Uh, oh, and the other thing is he realized he made a mistake. Up. I only saw this when I, when I put it into Photoshop and changed the contrast, but he'd obviously written something up here as well, which he'd rubbed out. You can just faintly see it here and when you change the contrast in Photoshop. Anyway, it's a bit of history, but it's, it gives you an idea of what people were doing. As so I say, um, I, didn't cope, I couldn't cope with that, so I wrote a program to align sequences, which was the beginning of my PhD. So 
and ultimately ended the thing and led led to things like Jalview. Yeah, basically, don't do what your PhD supervisor tells you. Do what you think is right and is going to save you time. Okay, <laughs> you go, you'll go fine. Okay, so let's go through what protein sequence alignment is, uh, how it's actually done. And this is kind of a bit, kind of about the methods. It's kind of a bit of good education for you. So how do you align two protein sequences? What are the programs that you use to align two protein sequences do? Um, you've got amino acids. There's 20 of them, typically. And you need to say how good is it to line particular pairs of amino acids. So you need some kind of scoring scheme for matching amino acids to each other. Uh, you need to cope with insertions and deletions because we know we have to do that. We looked at that structure alignment. If you've got a family of proteins, you have to put in insertions and deletions to align them. They're called gaps or indels sometimes. You heard, you'll see these kinds of terms used. And you need some kind of algorithm, some computer method to find that best alignment. And finally, and this is quite important and often overlooked, you need some way of judging if the alignment is likely to be correct. Because frankly, you can align anything to anything else with a computer program. And it doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily mean anything at all, the result you get. Example I often use is you could take Bible and Shakespeare and align them to each other. And uh, there's probably some elements in both that should be similar, but there's not, you know, clearly it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to do that. So you have protein scoring scheme. So this is basically a table um, for aligning every possible pair of amino acids. And the simplest one, you just say, well, if it's identical, it's a plus one. And if it's different, it's a zero. And nobody does that, right? The better schemes weight the similarities in amino acid properties, um, and they're called, there's two kinds of matrices that people use. One's called Blossom family, and the other one's called PAM. And typically, if for most purposes, you will use Blossom matrices. If you're an evolutionary biologist, they don't like the underlying theory be behind Blossom matrices, so they use this thing called PAM because it apparently has more theoretical backing. Um, anyway, but essentially the, the Blossom matrix is derived from looking at um, well-generated sequence. It's a kind of bootstrap process. You generate some sequence alignments you have confidence in, and then you look at the columns and you count how often you see pairs of amino acids substituting in that column, in each of the columns, and then there's some normalization done. And, and you end up with a thing that looks like this which is the Blossom 62 matrix. There's a whole family of matrices with different numbers here, and I'm not going to go into the details of how they're derived. But essentially, uh, this, is, this is known as a, as a log score matrix or a, a log likelihood ratio matrix. Um, again, those terms don't matter too much, although I will come back to log likelihoods in a minute. Don't panic. It's quite straightforward. You all know about fractions, don't you? In maths, in arithmetic, yes? Great, you'll follow the rest of this talk, no problem. It's easy. A lot of biologists are scared of maths. I'm scared of maths, so it's okay. We're on the same side here. It's not difficult stuff. Mungo here did a maths degree, so he's, he's, he's an expert on maths. Um, so um, what you've got here is a table. You've got the different amino acids across the top and the same amino acids down the side. And every number here represents a score for how how good it is to align those two amino acids. And effectively what it is, it's a, it's a log ratio. So it means if the number is positive, it means uh, you're more likely to see that pair of amino acids coming together um, than you would by chance alone. And if it's a negative number, you're less likely to see those two amino acids coming together in an alignment than by chance alone. Effectively, what it means is during evolution, you're less likely to see a change between two amino acids that have a negative number than you have two amino acids that have a positive number. Yes? What's the biological interpretation of the diagonal, that the numbers aren't all the same? Well, in this case, the diagonal the numbers are all the same. 4, 5, 6, 9, 5, 5, 6, 8, 4, 4. Well, they're not the same as each other. But, oh, the reason they're different to each other, sorry, they're, they're the same. Sorry, the upper diagonal here is the same as the lower diagonal, it's a symmetrical matrix. Um, sorry, I thought that's what you meant. The, the, they're different because of the different abundance of the amino acids. 
So if you look at tryptophan, for example, is one of the rarest amino acids. I'm not going on about, I'm not talking about uh, codons and codon usage and all these things, but it also is only coded for by one codon in, in RNA, DNA. If you look at tryptophan versus tryptophan, it's plus 11 in this matrix, which is the biggest number, and it's also the rarest amino acid. So what this encapsulates is not only the properties of the amino acids, but it's, its rarity. So hence, the, it combines, combines all that into a single table. In fact, the, the Venn diagram I showed you, the way that was generated was they took this matrix, or one like it, and did a thing called multidimensional scaling on it, principal components analysis, which takes this 20-dimensional table and projects it into two dimensions. And when you do that, the two principal di dimensions are hydrophobicity and charge. So that's a little bit of an aside, but that's the way that Venn diagram was first generated. Um, anyway, um, let's have a look. Oops, sorry. So for example, you can't really see this. It's terrible on here. But for example, aspartate versus aspartate is plus six. It's the same amino acid. But asp versus L. Somebody who's not a structural biologist and doesn't do sequence analysis. Come on, you're all experts on amino acids. You told me that, sorry. You knew you were amino acids. Excellent. Leucine, yeah. So leucine is what? It's a... Don't look it up. <laughs> hydrophobic, yeah. So, so we've got a charged amino acid and generally hydrophobic, and that's minus four. So a substitution. Changing a leucine into a polar amino acid, a charged amino acid, is not seen so often in evolution. And there's a good reason for that. If it's in the core of a protein and leucine is in the core of a protein, you substitute it with a small charged amino acid, it's got to somehow satisfy that charge, uh, typically by um, you know, salt bridge to water, you know, a bridge to water or to another amino acid, positively charged amino acid. So that somehow will disrupt the folding or the structure of the protein. Um, there's another example. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say on that. The second thing you have, so you have that table of numbers, and the second thing you have are gap penalties. So this is a penalty for inserting gaps. So we know what to do if we align an amino acid with another amino acid, but what do we do if we align an amino acid with a gap? We have to have a number for that as well. The simply, simplest method for that is you just have another number. But typically what happens is you have something like this, where you have two penalties, two numbers, one that you multiply by the length of the gap, and the other one that's a fixed penalty. So creating the gap costs you something. Making it longer costs you more, linearly with length. This is the kind of model, this is the kind of gap penalty model that's normally used for sequence alignment. Okay, so we have these two things. We have penalty and we have a score. And then you want to find the best alignment. So as I was saying earlier, you, the best alignment, and I put this in quotes, it is the mathematically best alignment that gives the highest score um, when you align the two sequences, taking account of any gaps and the scoring scheme we're using and the gap penalty. And that's not necessarily the one that's biologically meaningful, and I'll come to that a bit later. So how do you do that? How do you find the best alignment? Well, the naive way, and the simplest thing you might think of first is you say, well, okay, I've got these two sequences. I generate all possible ways of aligning them. And then I will add up every column for each pair of sequences I've aligned and in that table and taking away the gaps and I'll get a number. And I'll do that for the next one. I'll do that for all possible pairs and I'll take the best one. And that would be the best alignment. And that would indeed be the best alignment score. Um, however, for two sequences of 100 amino acids, there are 10 to the power 75 possible different alignments, which is a big number. And that's only for 100 amino acids. And if you go to 1,000, then this number becomes more than the number of atoms in the universe. You know, it's an enormous number. It's just not practical to do this. So there's this technique called dynamic programming. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna show you very, very quickly what that means. It's a really clever, computing thing that all of these alignment programs do. And it avoids having to generate all the possible alignments. It was first introduced in 1970 in molecular biology, although it's older than that as a technique in computing, by these characters called Niedermann and Wunsch. They had a paper in Journal of Molecular Biology in 1970 for comparing protein sequences. And uh, it's really quite clever. There's lots of variations on the theme. 
and it's the basis of just about every sequence alignment program you're ever likely to use. Not quite all of them. And it is guaranteed to find the mathematically best score for alignment of two sequences of length m and n in mn steps. So product of the length of the sequences, so 10,000 steps for 200 long amino acid sequences. So that's a lot less than 10 to the 75. It's 10 to the 4. This is what it looks like. It's the kind of basic steps you go through. It looks horrendously complicated, but oops, let's go back. What you do, so here's this very simple case. We've got amino acid sequence down here, another one across the top. And here we're just scoring a one where they're identical and blank for anything else. A very simple scoring scheme. It's not the Blossom matrix. It's the simplest possible scheme. And there's no gap penalty here. So nothing, no penalty for gaps. And what you do is you run along each row, start in the bottom right-hand corner, and you go back across each row. And what you do for every cell here, you say, I've got a choice of three things. I can take... I take this number, in this case it's an R against an arginine, that's plus one, and then I look in this row and this column and I find the biggest number, in this case it's a four on this row, and I say, well, okay, I'll add that four to that one, because, and then I go on and do the next thing, I do exactly the same process again. So I look in row and column, add it in. If I had a gap penalty, I'd subtract the penalty when I did this row and column thing. But in this case, you don't. So you do that, you go along row by row by row, and you end up building up a big table of numbers. So the top left-hand corner then has a number that is the representation of the best possible alignment of the two sequences. And you can then trace your way back through the path, through the matrix, and say, well, how did I get to this number? Which route did I take? And by tracing your path back, you can build up the alignment of the two sequences from the table. So... This is something you'll never have to do by hand, but it's kind of useful just to know where it comes from. This is at the basis of all the programs you use, is this principle. If you want to know, if you want me to go through this in more detail with any of you and explain it, and you know, because it's, I think it's really cool, and sim you know, it's a really, really nice thing, very simple idea that works really powerfully. Um, it takes a little bit to get your head around it, but the basic thing is, you do these two stages, you build up the table, you trace it back, and you get the answer, you get the alignment and the score. In fact, this table has the score for all the alignments starting. Um, so if I want to know what's the best score for this little short sequence against the one that starts here, then the best score is three. You have, the, you have all the answers in one table, in one go. There are various variations on this approach. Lots of, as always with anything like this, there's lots of variants um, that do different things, but essentially that's dynamic program. So there may be, the point is here, and even in this simple case, there's two possible alignments that give the same score. And, and it's kind of important to re realize that these algorithms will give you, they normally, when you run a program, it gives you one answer, but um, there may well be more than one possible alignment that could be generated for that pair of sequences with exactly the same answer or with an answer, a score that's very, very similar. And most of protein, most alignment programs you use only give you one answer. They give you one alignment. And again, in the practical, you'll kind of get a feel for this by, by fiddling around with some parameters and uh, uh, different alignment programs. Okay, so that is, that's two sequences. How do you work with multiple sequence alignment? How do you generate multiple sequence alignment? That's just two sequences. You want to generate alignments for hundreds of sequences. How do you do that? So this is really, there are different ways to do this. So you might assume you can just extend this idea of two sequences to n. So let's think about that. Let's say if we do it to three sequences. So for three sequences, you'd need a three-dimensional matrix, or an array, not two. Um, I tried to draw this in PowerPoint and failed, because I, I, so I did it on paper. But essentially, this is a cube now. We've got one sequence, A, B, C sequences on the axes. You've got a cube at the center, and you're somehow building up your matrix of numbers uh, through this cube, adding numbers. But now you're looking at you know, all the sides of the cube rather than just the sides of a square. Um, <clears throat> It gets complicated very quickly. It's very hard to draw. It's not impossible to do. People have written programs to do this. Crazy people. 
Um, and you can, you can do it for small, short, relatively short sequences. Um, for end sequences, of course, um, then you need an n-dimensional array, not three dimensions, you need four, five, six, hundred dimensional array. It gets a little bit hairy, I think, then, you know. Bit difficult to think about, even visualize in your head, let alone know how to code it. And clearly the time required, the storage space required for the matrix and the time required to do the calculation go up some hor horrific um, exponential way. So, um, as I say, you need this n-dimensional hypercube. It's very complicated, very memory intensive, very CPU intensive. And as I say, to align 100 sequences of length 100, you'd have to store 100 to the power 100 bytes in order to do that. And that's a big number. There's probably more storage than we have on the planet. Um, so you don't do that. It's not practical. Nobody does that. Having said that, I think, oh no, yeah, I didn't. I just say that people have written programs to do n-way dynamic programming up to about 15 sequences, but they use various tricks so you don't have to calculate the whole thing. And uh, again, they're crazy people who have to. Some, you know, computer scientists have to have something to do. Right? Okay. So. Not all computer scientists are crazy. Don't, don't. I'm not trying. I'm not being racist here. Honestly, <laughs> they're not. Uh, they're not. They're not all crazy. Um, alternatives to dynamic programming. So there are other approaches. Um, I've talked about dynamic programming. I said most programs do this. There are things called genetic algorithms, which are used in other computer. It's another computer science trick, um, and uh, that's been implemented in something called Saga program. It's not practical for large numbers of sequences, and so what everyone does and what most methods do is something called hierarchical multiple alignment, and I'll explain how that works because it's a kind of trick that gets you, gets you alignments that are most of the time, well, in all the tests, they're at least as good as these ones done for three-way or n-way methods or genetic algorithms. So what you do is you do it in stages. So you first compare all pairs of sequences. We know how to do that. We know how to do two sequence alignments, so we just do that. You then use those pairs of sequences to generate a tree. I'm going to show you this graphically in a minute, and it'll be a bit clearer. You then follow the tree from leaves to root, building the alignment as you go. And as I say, virtually all current programs use this approach. The most popular is the Clustal family, and uh, the latest version of that, the one everyone recommends now, Clustal Omega. Um, you'll do this in a bit. Uh, more recent and more accurate programs, Probcons, MAFT, um, I say cluster, cluster, it's cluster W, cluster Omega is better than cluster L. And there's, there's a bunch of, there's another program called uh, Tea Coffee, which you'll use today as well. So let's look at an example of this and, and how, how, the, how the hierarchical multiple alignment works. So here we've got seven sequences and they have identifier codes, HAHU, HBHU. These are all globin sequences you know, from uh, uh, globins, bind, bind uh, heme and oxygen in your blood. And they're from different species. So uh, this one's leg hemoglobin. Uh, this is a lamprey, myoglobin, and then these are horse and human globins here. You compare them to each other pairwise and calculate some score for how similar they are based on dynamic programming. And I'll come back to what these numbers mean in a minute. And then you do cluster analysis on these scores. And what you do is you start off by finding the simplest thing to do is take, find the biggest number in this table and you say, well, okay, that's HBHO against HBHU. So we say, well, that's the most similar pair. So we'll put those two together in the tree, yeah, in this dendrogram. And then we look for the next biggest number, which actually happens to be HAHU against HAHO. So we'll put those two together. <coughs> and once you put them together, you keep them together. Then we look and we look at the next biggest number, and that turns out to be something that's it's either H it's one of these pair against one of these pairs. So you say, okay, we'll put those together. And then you carry on doing that process. So if it's um, if you're at each of these stages, as you build up the as you build up the alignment, what you do is you say, well, okay, I'll align these two sequences first, then I'll align these two sequences, because I know I, they're the most similar ones. So they're going to be easiest to align. If I got to put two 
alignment. Then you, then you have this alignment here and alignment here, and you want to put them together. So then you align the alignments. You don't change the alignments. And I'll show you that graphically. What you do is something that's called profile comparison. So you have basically three possible things that can go on as you build up the multiple alignment. You can compare two sequences and produce an alignment. So that's called pairwise alignment. You can take an alignment of sequences and compare it to a single sequence. And that's called profile alignment because this thing is called a profile and I'll explain that in a minute. So you're saying I keep that fixed. I don't change the relative alignment of these sequences. Keep them fixed. Or you can align two alignments that you've already generated and that's called profile profile alignment. And that way you build up your multiple alignment in a hierarchical fashion. Now this is not guaranteed to best give you the best mathematically best alignment possible for all the sequences. But for biological sequences, it typically gives you alignments that are pretty good and very useful and very close to the best possible alignment. So what's a profile? I've talked about profiles. What do I mean by profile? So this is an important concept because it's not only important in multiple sequence alignment, it's also important when you do database searching with something like Cyblast or Hidden Markov Model or any of these methods. And those are techniques that you will increasingly see. You'll come across these when you look at uh, resources online um, or you do database searches, you want to use the best possible methods. So what is a profile? So we have a multiple alignment we've already generated, say, like this one. And you can calculate various numbers from this alignment. So you can do simple things like look at every column and count how many of each amino acid are present in each each column. So what you want to do, what we're generating with a profile is a representation of this sequence alignment that we can then use in some way to do, uh, to do alignment with. So what do I mean by that? Here's, here's a part of the alignment. Now, now I'm looking at a, a, what we call a frequency profile. So now we're looking at the position in the alignment running down the page. It's actually not that previous alignment. This is an alignment I think of immunoglobulin domains and there's several hundred sequences here. So each, each row here is a different column in the, pre, in the alignment, if you like. It's the position where these sequences are aligned. And each column here is a different amino acid. And these numbers are just the numbers of times I see a particular amino acid in a particular position. So if we look at alanine at the first thing, there's 95 at position 1, 161 at position 3, 409 at position 12, and so on. So we're going down the position in the alignment, amino acid types. And then the last column is how many gaps we have at each position. So we count those as well. So at the 11th position in the alignment, I've got 728 glycines and 48 prolines okay, in the alignment and 13 gaps. So what you do is you take that frequency profile that tells you something in its own, you know, you can start to see, well, there's a lot of glycines here, that must mean something. But you convert that into what we call a log odds profile. And what this is, is the proportion of a particular amino acid type at a position, divided by the proportion of that amino acid in the whole alignment. And then you take uh, the logarithm of that. So that's what I said about ratios, okay? This is very simple mathematics, but very fundamental to what you do with sequence comparison. It's just a ratio. So, so that gives you a negative number when the amino acid is less common at a position than it is in the alignment as a whole, and a positive number when it's more common at a position than it is in alignment as a whole. So it kind of corrects for the, the composition of the sequences you've got and the uh, alignment. So I say the conversion actually is a little bit more complicated than this because you have to deal with missing data. So you don't always have every amino acid at every position and you have to deal with that and there's ways around that. I'm not going to go through how, exactly how you do that, but you take background scores typically from a matrix like the Blossom matrix. So let's give an example with some numbers. So if we've got an alignment of 30 sequences, each of 100 amino acids, that means there's 3,000 amino acids in the entire alignment. At position 97 in the alignment maybe has 20 prolines. There are 300 prolines in the alignment as a whole. So the number you calculate, you can calculate um, a proportion here. There's 20 divided by 30, so that's the proportion of uh, prolines at position 97, because there's 20 divided by 30 sequences. 
And then you have 300 proleins in the alignment as a whole divided by 3,000. That's the proportion in that, which gives you 20 divided by 3, which is 6.67. And if you take the log of that, base 10, it's 0.8, or it doesn't, is that log base 10? I can't remember. It's 0.82. It doesn't really matter what base you're working to. You get 0.82. So the score in the profile for proline at that position, 97, is 0.82. Um, whereas, and, and this, is, this is what's known in statistics as a log likelihood ratio. This is something you may come across. If you've ever done these statistics, you might have come across log likelihood ratios. But essentially, that's what it is. So it corrects for the proportion and all these things and gives you a nice number. So you end up with something called a log score profile when you do that process for the whole alignment and you get a table of numbers like this. Um, again, amino acid uh, sequence going down um, in position in the alignment and different amino acids across the top. These numbers are all multiplied by 100 and the reason for that is that it allows you to do integer arithmetic. Computers can multiply any numbers together and add any kinds of numbers, but they're much faster at working with numbers that don't have a decimal point in them, that are integers. And so to get speed on most of the programs that people use for this, they convert everything to integers and do integer arithmetic. So kind of detail, but that's why I've got a table here of integers, not a table of numbers with decimal points in. So you can look and you can say 728 glycines, that gives a score of 6.5, just divide by 100. 48 proleins give a score of minus 1.03. So at this position, glycine is favored over proline, okay? Because it's a positive score compared to a negative score. And now my computer is not moving on to the next slide. So um, how, does it, how do you use a profile in an alignment? And so we can calculate these profiles now for any alignment. You just do these sums and you get the numbers. So how do you use that when you're doing a profile sequence alignment? Well, you get the score for aligning a particular residue at a particular position. You don't get it from the blossom matrix, you now get it from the profile. So, um, and what it does is it emphasizes the position specific features of the protein family. So when you've got the alignment, it may highlight that there's always a glycine at a particular position, or there's always an asp at a particular position, or it's predominantly a charge. And it emphasizes that in scoring when you do the alignment. And this gives you much better, uh, a much better description of that protein family than just looking at a single sequence and using a blossom matrix, which is derived from all possible alignments of all possible families. So for example, the position specific score here of glycine at position 11, it's plus 6.5, but if you were to look at glycine aligned with glycine in the blossom matrix, it's only 0.6. So it's saying that this position in this alignment is much more favored to be glycine than it would be just in general for glycine. Does that make sense? Yeah. And whereas aligning to glycine at position 23, it scores minus one and a half, so that position, glycine, is much less favored than it would be even in the blossom matrix where it scores plus 0.6. Okay. So what you're doing then, instead of this is dynamic programming, again, I found it too hard to draw. So this is, this is now, you've got a sequence against another sequence, but you're either, um, <clears throat> for two sequences, you're aligning a sequence to a sequence. You're looking up the score in a blossom matrix. Um, but in... in um, for two proteins, it just comes from the blossom matrix, the score here. Um, but for an alignment on one of these axes against the sequence, you're looking it up in that log odds profile. So if A and B are both profiles, so it can be a, an A can be a profile and B can be a sequence, a single sequence, or it can be two profiles. If you're aligning two profiles, then you have to combine the scores from two profiles. And I'm not going to explain how that works, but essentially you can do that mathematically, and it's um, impossible to do that. Okay, this is a short intermission while I just think about why I put this slide in. Uh, anyway, this is a nice sequence alignment. Um, they're kind of useful things. You can make them nicely colored. Um, this, was, uh, this is actually isopenicillin, isopenicillin N synthetases. And it, this alignment went along with the uh, first paper to describe the three-dimensional structure of an isopenicillin N synthetase family protein. And... Uh, 
I somehow got ended up as a co-author on the paper, even though I didn't solve the structure, but we did some analysis of the sequences and this paper, this figure went into it. So I wrote Chidao in 1995.